shall I see Jesus and reign with him above and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. All right, as far as possible as we begin, if you'll join as we kneel in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, here as we approach the holy hours of the Sabbath, we've just sang the song, Give Me the Bible. And I know that was your leading. Father, it's the Bible and the Bible only that we must follow. No arm of flesh. But Father, tonight as we begin to address this subject and uh, consequently a study that will follow that, I pray, Father, now that you would set me aside. I desire more than anything just to be the instrument that you use, but that it clearly is your voice that we hear. And I pray that you would make the connections in each of our hearts. I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit and your mighty angels to fill this place and my heart, my mind. And may the truths, the things that I share, Father, truly be uh, the truth according to your word. I thank you for this glorious Sabbath day approaching. I thank you for this opportunity, Father. And I humbly get out of your way and invite you to speak your message to us. It's my prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. The study that we're going to begin to unpack as this weekend progresses uh, centers around Joel. And there's a lot of interest in Joel right now for a lot of different reasons. And I want to say at the outset of this particular study that, that that's exactly what it is. It's a Bible study. And I never want to take the position that my understandings are flawless. And uh, I believe that the Word of God, though, is sure. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is the one who leads us into all truth. Uh, there are, there's a lot of discussion over the book of Joel at this time, and I want you to understand that I'm not in any way trying to um, push any view that I have to the forefront, and I, I need you to believe that. Um, in fact, the reality is, is that the Lord has given me no other choice but to present these truths. And it's not a situation that I have a desire to be in, but I recognize the way the Lord has led me in the past that I must share these things. So as I begin to share them, I want you to understand that if, if there are those that hold a different view than me, I am not trying to set a view above another view. Um, I may be convicted of a certain point, and you may see that in my uh, enthusiasm in presenting this, but I am always open to receive greater light or to see where I have taken a misstep in God's Word. And friends, we all have to be that way. Um, a dear brother of mine once, I asked him, when I realized I had made a mistake in my calculations, I said, how do we avoid this? And he says, the longer you preach, you'll discover that you cannot avoid, you cannot avoid this. So, with that said, I want to read a quote to you taken from uh, Councils to Writers and Editors, page, beginning in page 34. And many of us are acquainted with this quote. But it says a lot more than I think in the beginning we were willing to see. In light of the discussion centering around Joel today, um, I want you to know that there's no debate, there's no heated discussion. There's a considering of this book from every point or every place within Adventism today, it would seem. <clears throat> and I base that on my own personal interaction with God's people as I've traveled this year. But this quote makes a powerful statement, and I want it to become the springboard of this study. There's a brother that asks Sister White a question. And this is, begins by saying, A brother asked Sister White, Do you think we must understand the truth for ourselves? Why can we not take the truths that others have gathered together and believe them because they have investigated the subjects?
And then we shall be free to go on without the taxing of the powers of the mind and the investigation of all these subjects. Do you not think that these men who have brought out the truth in the past were inspired of God? Now, who is she speaking about? What kind of men is she talking about? Well, one of them is her husband, Brother James White, Hiram Edson, William Miller, Joseph Bates. Sound men in God's Word. Men who, Sister White says, knew what it was to search for truth as for hidden treasure. Okay? This is the men that she's talking about. And another quote of hers, she has picked it. She's in Australia. I remember this quote where she picks up a magazine, a periodical or a newsletter of sorts, where the brethren have been writing articles and she's reminded again that these truths need to be reprinted because there are many truths in God's Word that they have brought forward. But she's going to make a, a statement here that should, um, it should confront all of us. And she says this, I dare not say that they were not led of God, for Christ leads into all truth. But when it comes to inspiration, in the fullest sense of the word, I answer no. Now what she just did was she set her writings above the writings of William Miller, Joseph Bates, James White, Hiram Edson. And these brothers are dear and sincere brothers. We wouldn't have a church today uh, apart from them. These men knew what it was to sacrifice and Brother White even unto death. But she wants to make a distinction in the way of inspiration. Now, the beginning, the question is what should alarm us. And you and I would say quickly, no, you can't do that. You've got to eat the little book. We talk about eating the little book. Now, I reached back through the years of being in this message since 2004. There's a lot of catchphrases that have come along. One of them that stands out is that we need to eat the little book. It's going to be sweet in our mouth. We're going to have that bitter in our stomach experience as we share it with our church members. And many of us, many of us have experienced that and then some. But friends, I don't believe that we really understand what it means to eat the little book. When we are out here sharing truths today, those that are sharing uh, presenting truth as they're understanding it, standing before God's people on a regular basis. There is a tendency for Adventists to park themselves in front of that presenter, make sure they have their handout before they leave, go to their website and print off the handout if they didn't get it, get the DVDs, and go home educated. There is a process that I see play out again and again, and I've been to many prophecy schools. And people come back the next year, and they're still in the same spiritual condition. They're still th thinking the same way spiritually. And what they're not recognizing is that a condition has developed within those that are understanding and presenting and sharing present truth. It's like this. Years ago, I was given a 3ABN dish. And that dish, well, it wasn't just a 3ABN dish, but it allowed me to view 3ABN, but it had other religious broadcasting as well. And there was some really nice uh, scripture songs with, with uh, scripture and videos of beautiful uh, landscape of nature. And my boys and I used to love to sit in front of the TV in the morning, eat our cereal, just watching scripture float across the screen and, and, and beautiful serene music and the deer out in the grass, the fields, or whatever it was. Very placid. And suddenly one day we had no TV any longer. And what was supposed to have been lifetime rights was only if it was parked at the house of the person who bought it. So they cut it off. And I asked the Lord, why did you do that? And he made me to understand something. He wanted me to have a living connection with him. He did not want me to park myself in front of 3ABN and listen to sermon after sermon after sermon, listening, but never eating the book, never picking up my Bible and seeing whether that speaker was accurate, whether he was presenting the truth or not. There is a challenge within Adventism today among those in present truth that we keep taking in the message, but we're wondering, when are we going to change? 
Well, I would suggest that maybe it's how we're taking in the message. I believe that the, the book of Joel coming under discussion the way that it is, is pointing us to the fact that we need to know what the Word of God says for ourselves. That we're going to have to, this is what it is, to be connected to the vine, to be grafted in. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you should not enter into the kingdom of heaven. We need to recognize, friends, we need a living connection with our Lord and Savior. We must have it. And you know something? Jesus is ready. He stands ready. So many are taking in the message today, and it's a glorious light that attends it, I might add. But there is a great danger that we will sit in front of people just like many of the nominal Adventists sit under their pastors in their churches, receive what is there because why? Because our lives are so busy. Our lives are so busy we don't have time to, to take up our Bible and see whether this is actual. Let's follow our center column references. Let's get out our, our concordances and compare and see whether these things are so like the Bereans do. We don't have time. We can trust brother so-and-so. He's, he's not let me down yet. He's preached some good, solid stuff. Friends, that's the very same thing that the nominal Adventists are saying about their pastors that they've been sitting under. Now, I don't believe that the pastors start out by saying, I'm going to see how many Adventists I can lead into the ditch. I don't believe they start that way. I believe they're sincere. Confused, but sincere. And they lead many out into the broad path. But the way is narrow at the end of the world. And according to Sister White's first vision, it's Jesus that's just before us. And who is Jesus? He's the Word. He's the thus saith the Lord. And He's leading us to the city. And as long as we follow Him, we are safe on that narrow path. We keep our eyes on Jesus. But today, friends, there's a great challenge among us because there's a, a consideration of Joel, and there's things that through the study this weekend that we're going to consider from Scripture, and you may see things differently than you have in the past. You may not. But either way, whatever the outcome of this study, Jesus wants to emphasize that you and I have to have a living connection with Him. Uh, notice in Jeremiah chapter 3, we'll begin in Jeremiah chapter 3, laying some groundwork before this study now, uh, considering some principles. Uh, we want to go to Jeremiah in chapter 3. And join me in verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. There's a promise that God gives us concerning information today. Now last year we did a series entitled uh, The Temple Cleansed. And it was in two parts. The second part was three parts of a total of seven that dealt with the false shepherds. And it was not a critical attack against leadership. It was emphasizing what I'm saying here now. That you and I have to stop leaning on the arm of flesh and start leaning on the arm of Christ, or thus saith the Lord. Because Revelation 14 says that they will follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. And He, the Lamb, is Christ, and Christ is the Word. So the only way you and I are going to find our way into heaven is how? as we follow the Word. All right? Notice Jeremiah 3.15. Jesus promises, He says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with what? Knowledge and understanding. When you feed sheep, what do they do with the grass? Take it in and swallow it whole? They break it down. They break the Word down. God is wanting you and I to realize that as you're sitting under whoever, myself included, that the words that you're hearing, they have to filter through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Because there's only one thing that leads us into all truth. Only one thing. I can tell you truth all day long, but do you know the Bible says, I can never convince you of truth? That's amazing. I've experienced that, it seems. <laughs> When you're trying to share truth with somebody and you just you can't get through. But the reality is, is the agency of the Holy Spirit is not able to get through. It's not me. 
It could be me. It could be the way that I'm speaking to them. It could be if I have a short temper or short fuse or if I'm indignant or condescending that I'm surely going to keep the Holy Spirit from working. But if I do my part, it still is a work that the Holy Spirit has to do upon the heart of the listener. So as you're sitting here through this, this study, understand that the Spirit of God is the one who you can trust in to guard you from error. God is going to feed us. He's going to feed all of us. And He's going to bring forth men who will feed us with knowledge and with understanding. But it's the Spirit of God that takes the Word of God and applies it to our hearts. Okay? Man does not take the Word of God and apply it to our hearts. He may get the credit in many instances, but the work is truly accomplished by the agency of God's Holy Spirit. John 16, if you'll come to John chapter 16, uh, to emphasize and put this in place more permanent, John chapter 16, looking at the work of the Holy Spirit, in verse 13, John 16, 13 says, concerning the work of the Holy Spirit, how be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into almost every truth. Now, listen, in my Bible, this is highlighted in green because for me, green is representative of promises. When God says, when Jesus tells you and I that He, will, the Spirit of truth, will lead us into all truth, what is required of us in that process? Well, the very first step is you have to believe that. The just, excuse me, the just shall live by their faith. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. And the Word says that Jesus is going to send the agency of the Holy Spirit and that He will lead you into all truth. Now listen, there's no prerequisites right there. Catch this now. See this. When I came into this church, initially there were certain things I didn't want to read because I didn't know anything. You know what that is? That's me counting on me to catch error. But that's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to rest by faith in Christ knowing that the agency of the Holy Spirit is going to show you what is truth and what is error. This is how it works. It's not contingent upon man's wisdom. If it were, we would never learn. Okay, the Spirit of God is, is His job to impress upon our minds the truths of God's Word. And I'm telling you, I believe with every fiber of my being that if I'm reading a study of another sister or another brother and there is error there and I'm asking the Lord to show me and guard me from the error, I believe He's going to do it. I believe it with no doubt. Thus I have no fear. Okay, so as we're considering this study, and if you're looking at this later on, Whatever it is that I'm going to share here, the Scripture verses, if I'm misapplying them, guess who's going to show you that I am? The Spirit of God. And may He show me the same. If it's truth, guess who's going to convict you that it's truth? It's not contingent upon your wisdom. All right, let's park that. We cannot have enough wisdom to understand God's Word because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And I'll need a... What's, a, what's our time count on this so far? So I'll know. I know we got a little bit later start. I just want to know when to end. Take as much as you need. Well, okay, for the recording purposes, I thought. But anyway, so here, here's what we're dealing with. Now I'm just recapping. There are brethren that ask Sister White, can't we just take what these brethren have learned? Right? And there are many series out there, aren't there? You just go to Seven Thunders, Brother Edgar. There's loaded with information out there. You sit, park yourself in front of the computer and you can stuff your brain with all kinds of knowledge. But are we learning? I understand that only the Holy Spirit can help me learn, truly learn. I can have lots of knowledge. The Bible talks about those who are ever learning and never coming to an understanding of the truth because the Spirit of God is not present. All right. Now, don't take that and run with it to say that that if the, those that are standing in opposition to the view that I may share don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm not implying that at all. I believe that God has intentionally brought a condition into the present truth movement to remind us that we need to study. Amen. We need to study for ourselves. You know why? This is why I believe. One, one element why. Because if we begin to study for ourselves, guess how many people the Spirit of God can then begin to bring light through? 
who understand what they're talking about. This is what God must have, and this is what he's working on. That's one of the elements, one layer of thought, uh, if you will. John chapter 6, I said to you earlier, Jesus says, unless you and I eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, we're not going to heaven. And what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood is to get into his word. There's no greater experience. This is my personal testimony. There is no greater experience that I've had in my entire life than to be in God's Word in search for an understanding of something. And suddenly, He opens the doors and you see it. He removes the obstacle that was before you that you saw could not be moved. And He brings forth Scripture to show you how it is this now and it's not that. The revelations in God's Word that He wants to bring to each of us is to be our personal experience. And this is what each of us must have. So if you're sitting here listening, if you're listening to this later, you need to understand that Christ is inviting all of us into that relationship where we're going to have that living connection. What is referenced by this living connection? What does it mean? In what context is that given? I am the vine, ye are the branches. So it's in reference to being grafted in. It's in reference to what is it that the vine has that the branches need? In the context of the vine and branches. So that it doesn't die. The living fluids. The sap. Okay, the, Probably more accurately said, but either way. If you and I are not grafted into the vine, and have that living connection by eating His flesh and drinking His blood, guess what? The branch will wither up. And guess what happens to the branches that wither up? What's done with them? They're gathered into bundles to be burned, brothers and sisters. But Jesus says, if you're grafted in, the living sap flows. And, and by the way, we're grafted in by faith. Okay, that's the, that's the glue. So we're grafted in now and we're receiving the living sap. Then what? What's the natural process? Come spring. All right. The, the leaves unfurl. Photosynthesis takes place. The plant begins to be fed. But there's a budding and then there's a bearing of fruit. And you know something? You don't harvest anything that doesn't bear fruit. So if we're not bearing fruit, it's because we're not grafted in. We're not eating of His flesh and drinking of His blood. So if you want to start having the living experience that Jesus intends that we all have here at the end of the world, you know, people say, well, brother, I, I'm just not seeing the, this message change lives. I'm just not seeing it. And I'm, I'm aware that there are personalities out here that are, can regurgitate every aspect of the message but lack the Spirit of Christ in their demeanor, in their deportment, and how they deal with people. There's a haughtiness there in, in, in some cases. And what I'm saying is, is that, friends, by beholding, we become changed. And the more that we stand before Christ, kneel before Christ, pour out our heart before Christ, plead with Christ to show us what is truth, show us the pathway, the more He opens to us, the more our relationship strengthens, the more love and adoration we have for our precious Lord. But we have to be in His Word. And I know you're probably sitting there saying, yeah, I know, brother, that's my experience. Amen. If so, praise the Lord. But I dare say many of us struggle to find those experiences that make you stand up out of your chair and shout hallelujah audibly. When I used to study Daniel 2 back in 2005, I, would walk, I was literally walking through cornfields where I lived in Virginia, vast fields, talking to God. I'd write notes on posty notes, verses that I didn't understand. And I'd write them down on either side and stick them back to back. And I'd walk and I'd talk to God and I'd reason with God and I'd plead with God to show me what is the answer to this. This doesn't make sense to me. And He answers me in a cornfield. And He answers me with Scripture. Is that unique for me? Am I something special? Well, I am because He gave Jesus, but no more than you are. Jesus wants to have this living connection with each of us. Because you and I are supposed to be witnesses to the power of God to take us from here and put us here. 
when we see no way to cross the chasm, it's all about what Jesus can do. But if Jesus is over there and you're over here, and by faith you do not become grafted in, begin to get into His Word and understand His Word for yourself, you're never going to understand the truth for this time. It's going to pass you by, and you'll stand with a majority that say, I just don't see it. I, I don't get it. It's not, I, why does that change my life? There's something spiritual that happens as we begin to eat and digest His Word. John chapter 10. You're already in John uh, 16. Go back to chapter 10 and notice verse 1 with me. John chapter 10, verse 1. Let's read the first five verses together. <clears throat> in light of, or in the context of what we're discussing, in the book of John chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is talking to you and I every day, every minute. If you're saying, why didn't I hear? It's because we're not listening. We're not being still that we might hear. Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. This is to be said of God's people right now. Jesus is our precious Lord and Savior, is also our shepherd, desiring to lead us. Okay? He doesn't want you following other men. He's a very jealous God, we discover in the commandments. He's a very jealous God. That jealousy is connected with his love for us, which is also connected with the price he paid for us. He has every reason to be jealous. There's not a soul on this planet that he doesn't desire to save. So here he is, he's setting you and I out before him today. And he's calling to us. And guess what we do? We run over here, we go over there. But he's still calling to us. We have to understand, come to recognize that voice. That we might follow the Lamb. Do you know why? Because in Revelation 14, it says that the 144,000, they're following the Lamb whithersoever He goeth, and that they are redeemed from where? From among men. The only reason they're redeemed from among men is because they're no longer following men. But if you're following men, you cannot be redeemed from among men. We've got to be following Christ. And friends, I know that I'm sincere, but I'm a man. I know that my brethren are very sincere potentially more sincere than I am, more experienced than I am. And I cannot begin to judge their heart or intentions, but we are men. And my counsel, the word of God's counsel to us is, cease from man whose breath is in his nostrils. You and I have to understand every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is neither variableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not change. He's constant. He's consistent. He's always listening to you. He's always ready to answer your questions when I might be busy. Or my other brethren might be busy. Or tied up with things. Or out of the country. Jesus is always there. Friends, we're just tools. Every one of us are just tools in spreading the gospel. But, but enough of this now. One last thought. John 17.3 one of my favorite verses and probably one that I've used more than any other verse in my life is John 17, 3, because it has become the foundation of my Christian experience. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus makes a very profound, permanent, and eternal statement. For this is life eternal. Eternal life is about this, Wesley that you might know me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All right, it's, eternal life is about knowing Jesus. And of course, if you know Jesus, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Therefore, if you know Jesus, you know the Father. But eternal life is about knowing Christ, and Christ is the Word. 
This is why in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you, which is to say, you never knew me. But this is what eternal life is all about. We need to make Jesus our focal point because by beholding Him, we become changed. Not the teachings of men. I can give you the, the most sincere and best application of Scripture, but only the Holy Spirit can, can bring conviction of sin. Only the Holy Spirit can take that truth and make it a reality in my Christian experience. Only the Holy Spirit can take that truth and connect it with other truths that He has already established as truths in my mind. I can't do that. I don't know what's in your heart and mind. Praise God, that's not my job. <clears throat> I want to begin our study. Our study is going to begin in the book of Joel.